those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Thank you. Yeah, the meter is moving on there, Joanne. The green, yeah, green, I, uh, have, I have the green meter yeah. moving here. Mm -hmm. She just said she can't listen. Yeah. Oh, okay. much. She said it's not you guys. It's 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 <laughs> not <laughs> I'm Sorry. No problem. Okay. She may not want to listen today. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> Good. We're in our we're in our simple Jesus series, uh, week week six, and. You, might, you may wonder, well, what are we reading from Jeremiah, the Old Testament, in a Simply Jesus series? But it'll come clear when we get to our speaker and presenter today. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, sharing these these messages with you guys. I, yes. This week I went through a bunch of the others, and you know, you could, we could go on until Christmas, but but uh, then I'd get accused of being lazy and not preparing anything. <laughs> but I do think I picked out the ones that that uh, the seven that maybe meet us where we are right now and uh, would be more, maybe most valuable to all of us as a community. So uh, this this gathering, this Simply Jesus gathering, is, is a group of folks who are instrumental in calling the church's attention right now. It's easy to get sidetracked and forget that as Christians, our first love is, is the man Jesus. It's not even the Bible. Uh, it is the man Jesus. It is, it is him. Now, we learn a lot about him through the Bible, but he also speaks to us and meets us in many other ways. In the sacraments, every time we share in the body and blood of Christ here today, from week to week, we meet with him. He, he, uh, and if you're like me, uh, he speaks to me differently every week as we partake in that. So that's something we can value. Uh, just how finding Jesus in each other and in community is another way he speaks to us. So there's many ways uh, that God speaks to us, uh, encounters us, apart from his word. And that's not to diminish the word. It's just to say that that's not the only place we meet him. That's a, an important place. So learning the ways of Jesus is, is our core statement of purpose. And this week is number six. We've, listened, we've heard from Conrad Gempf, Bruxy Cavi, Carl Medeiros, Brian Zond, and Lynn Heibel so far. This week, we'll hear from Father Greg Boy, Boyle. There's a, there's a Greg Boyd and a Greg Boyle, and I often mix the two up, even though they're not at all alike. But Father Greg Boyle works in Southern California. He's a Catholic priest. And he started years ago, I think some 19 years or 17 years ago, uh, a place called Homeboy Industries. He serves in up to 20 uh, prisons and detention centers each week, saying mass in those different places. And it, in that process, he's met a lot of gang members over the years. And he started this, this operation called Homeboy Industries to give... Uh, gang members, many of them ex-convicts, a place to re-enter the community and, and to find a place of purpose for their lives. So he's been doing this and he's considered an, uh, an expert on how to reintegrate uh, gang members back into society. And so he's an interesting character. He's a fun, he's a uh, He's a touching speaker. If you like me, every, I've watched this several times, and uh, I found some value in watching a lot of these several times, but none more than his, because I didn't get how he framed this message until I, about the third time I watched it. And so you may not catch it, but he's very deliberate in what looks like he's just kind of rambling at the beginning. And then you hear the bulk of his story where he's talking about uh, two homeboys that he took to a, to speak with him. And then he pulls the whole thing back together at the end and you realize, or at least it took me a few viewings to realize, oh, this is a really, really well-crafted talk. It's like this, the parables that Jesus tells. You know, sometimes you listen to the parable and 
you don't realize how well crafted it was until you get into it and get into the details. And so that's how it struck me. Unfortunately, you guys, this will be your first hearing, so you may not appreciate all of that. But uh, anyway, I'm just teasing you with it. That it is a well crafted talk, I guess that's what I'll say. He's, uh, I won't say any more. Everybody ready for Father Greg Boyle? <laughs> Here we go. Thank you. Well, it's the privilege of my life. Uh, for 30 years, I've worked with gang members, and they've taught me everything of value. The day won't ever come when I have more courage, or I am more noble, or I am closer to God than the thousands of men and women who have walked through our doors at Homeboy Industries in the last 27 years. People like Lewis, um, he kind of runs the place along with a handful of other gang members. He's been to prison, tattooed, was a heroin addict for a long time. Now he runs the place. He's become something of a public speaker in his own right. So we went to dinner the other night and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly. He said, you know, you have to pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. I said, yeah, no shit. Uh, so brace yourselves. The truth is we do have to brace ourselves if we want to have integrity in following Jesus. We, we want to stand and go where he goes. Of course, the secret of the ministry of Jesus was that God was at the center of it. And we want to imitate the kind of God we believe in, a God who loves us without measure and without regret, the God who is just too plain busy loving us, have any time left to be disappointed in us. I'm in 20 different detention facilities where I, I say Mass as a priest, and California, especially Southern California, LA County has a lot of those places. And so I was at Mass one day in, uh, in a huge gym, about 300 mainly gang members, and I was uh, sitting there listening to the word being proclaimed by these gang members, and I had the liturgical sheet on my lap, and I thought, oh, I'm going to listen, I'm not going to follow along. And a homie got up, uh, he was reading uh, something from a psalm, I think, and he had sort of an overabundance of confidence, and he said, the Lord is exhausted. I said, what the hell? And so I look at the sheet and, and it says, the Lord is exalted. And I thought, wow, that's way better. <laughs> if I were God, I would want to be exalted. But I think God has other plans. He's just sort of interested in being exhausted. You know, the good kind of tired that spends itself. You know, the one that's too busy loving you to be disappointed. So we brace ourselves, because if we follow Jesus, it means you stand where he stands. St. Ignatius of Loyola says, see Jesus standing in the lowly place. And so with Jesus and God, we stand at the margins. We brace ourselves because people will accuse us of wasting our time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice who sing. You follow Jesus and you make those voices heard. And with Jesus and God at the center of his life, you imagine a circle of compassion. And then you imagine nobody standing outside that circle. And to that end, you seek with all your heart to dismantle the barriers that exclude, because inclusion is the only thing that matters to Jesus, as it does to God. And we inch our way out to the margins where we will find the poor and the powerless and the voiceless see Jesus standing there in the lowly place. And we stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear, and we stand with those whose dignity has been denied, and every once in a while, oh, what a privilege it is to be able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized, 
so that the demonizing will stop and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. If I were Jesus, I would want it to be all about me. That's how I know that this is the furthest thing from Jesus' mind. He wants it to be all about us, about a community of kinship such that he, in fact, might recognize it. He wants it to be about exquisite mutuality, where there is no us and them, there's just us. He wants it to be about the kind of transformation that anchors us in the truth of how God sees us, that we are exactly what God had in mind when God made us. And so then we, with those on the margins with whom we're privileged to stand, we become that truth, we inhabit that truth. And no bullet can pierce it, no four prison walls can keep it out, and death can't touch it because it's huge. The kinship that we create by standing at the margins and ensuring that there is no daylight that separates us is the only praise that Jesus has any interest in. So I've written a book, and, and occasionally universities will force their students to read my book. I'm not complaining. And so my alma mater, Gonzaga University in Spokane, uh, forced their freshmen to read my book, and so they invited me up. And they said, please bring two homies with you. And, and uh, I always pick homies. We have 500 folks who work at Homeboy Industries. I always pick homies who are, who are rivals, who are enemies, um, you know, just so that they have to share the same hotel room, just to mess with them, you know. And um, so I picked Bobby, an African-American gang member who worked in our homeboy bakery, and Mario, a Latino gang member who worked in our merchandise store at the time. Um, enemies, rivals. I always pick homies who, who have never flown before, um, just for the thrill of seeing them terrified in the sky. <laughs> and so I uh, picked these two, and never, I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times with men and women and more absolutely terrified and panicky of flying than this guy, Mario. I mean, it was really uh, something. He was, you know, hyperventilating. <laughs> we hadn't even gotten on the plane yet, you know. So we were at Burbank Airport, and it's a kind of a small airport if you've ever flown there, and it's big bay windows and Southwest Airlines principally, and and so Mario and I are sitting there, Bobby's walking somewhere, and, and our plane arrives, and you can see them there, and um, they don't have that hermetically sealed chute, you know, where you get onto the plane. They have the tarmac, so you have to walk onto the tarmac and climb up the stairs to get through the front door, or even the back door, which is a feature of Burbank. It's sort of like the President of the United States standing, walking up the thing. And I, Mario's sitting there, I go, well, there's our plane. <laughs> I'm thinking he may actually die before we walk up those stairs. And so um, suddenly our flight crew arrives, and there are two flight attendants, females, and they have very large cups of uh, Starbucks coffee, and they're schlepping up the front stairs. And Mario goes, when are we going to board the plane? And I said, well, as soon as they sober up the pilots, um, <laughs> there they go now. I probably shouldn't have said that, actually. So I should tell you that Mario uh, is probably the most tattooed individual who has ever worked at Homeboy Industries. And trust me, that's saying a lot. And he's just completely covered. He's all sleeved out. His neck is blackened with tattoos. His whole face is covered in tattoos, but for a circle where his eyes, nose, and mouth are covered. And I had never been in public with him. And, and I watched as people saw him, and they, they did this, you know, and mothers vaguely clutch their kids more closely. And I think, wow, isn't that interesting? Because if you went today to Homeboy Industries and, and said, name the kindest, most gentle soul that works there, they wouldn't say me. They'd say Mario, who works in the merchandise store. He's so kind. He's so gentle. Once he said to me, I've decided to be loving and kind in the world. 
who knows, maybe the world will return the favor. He was just so kind and over-the-top effusive in his own gratitude as the flight attendant on this plane of which he was so terrified of flying. He, uh, he didn't just take the peanuts, you know, and thank her. He, he grabbed her hand and he connected and he looked her in the eye and he said, thank you so much. And it was just over the top, you know. So, well, anyway, as happens, you go to these universities and they say, you have the big talk on Wednesday night and there will be 2,000 people there. But what they don't tell you is that they've scheduled 93 talks. So and so it's classy. And Mario sit in the back of the classroom. You get up and tell your stories. And they were nervous, especially Mario. But they got up and were magnificent stories of terror and torture. Unspeakable acts that had been perpetrated against them as children abandonment and neglect and honest to God if their stories had been flames you'd have to keep your distance otherwise you'd get scorched so the night time came and the place was packed and I told them just before I said look I want you each to get up and do five minutes a little snapshot so the people know who you are and then I can include you afterwards in the a question and answer session. And they were terrified, especially Mario, but they did a good job. And I did my 45 minutes, and when I was done, I, yeah, questions. And a woman over here, she stands, she goes, yeah, I got a question. It's for Mario. First question out of the gate is for Mario. So he walks up to the microphone, this tall drink of water, Mario, terrified. Yes. She goes, well, you say you're a father and you have a, a son and a daughter, and they're about to enter their teenage years, what wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what advice do you give them? And Mario closes his eyes, and he just wants to come up with the right answer, and he's kind of getting a hernia trying to do it, you know? And, and then when suddenly he blurts out, I just... And the second he says those two words, he buckles under the weight of it, and he closes his eyes, and he's visibly trembling, and he's clearly crying. And he seems to be staring at a piece of his story that only he can see, but he wants to get this sentence out. I, I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence. Until the woman who asked the question, she stands, and now it's her turn to cry. And she says, why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving. You are kind. You are gentle. You are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And 2,000 total perfect strangers stand and they will not stop clapping. And all Mario can do is hold his face in his hands. So overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had returned him to himself. And as these strangers did that, they were returned to themselves. Kinship, exquisite mutuality, the kingdom of God, no daylight separating us, joys in your joy complete, that you may be one. That is the only praise Jesus has any interest in. We're not invited to say Jesus. We're invited to see Jesus. We're invited to be Jesus.
The secret of the ministry of Jesus was that God was at the center of it. And we happen to have a God who is, is just plain old exhausted. But it's a good tired because it's in service, it's in compassion, it's in connection, it's standing in the lowly place exactly with Jesus. And so we brace ourselves. We'll little understand what it is that we're about if we follow Jesus. And sometimes as we stand at the margins in the lowly place with Jesus, we look under our feet and we notice that the margins are getting erased because we chose to stand there. And sometimes we look under our feet and it doesn't feel even more inclusive than when we started. And consequently, people will accuse us of wasting our time because we chose to stand in that lowly place. But in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. We make those voices heard, and that matters to Jesus. Thank you very much. Does that wreck anybody like it does me? <laughs> Imagine a circle of compassion, then imagine no one standing out that circle, outside that circle. Dismantle the things that exclude, because inclusion is the only thing that matters to Jesus. Jesus wants it to be exquisite mutuality, where there's no us and them, but just us. We've been talking about those themes for the last few weeks, and uh, I think Father Boyle exemplifies that in his ministry, exemplifies how that's possible. And uh, 